Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's installment of our Lunch Bite series. My name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the great pleasure of serving as Director of Operations and Scholarship for the United States Capitol Historical Society. We're so grateful that so many of you took time out of your busy week to join us uh, for a little bit of art and art history in the Capitol building. Before we get started with today's program, I'd like to go over a couple of technical housekeeping matters. There are some great ways that we like to use this webinar platform to engage with you, our wonderful audience. Uh, if you have any questions for Steve uh, over the course of his presentation today, uh, and he is planning some stops uh, for questions, you can submit those into the Q&A section of the webinar platform. That looks like two little speech bubbles, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on what kind of device you're using to join us today. If you have any technical troubleshooting questions, if you feel like you're having difficulty seeing us or hearing us over the course of today's event, you can put those questions into the chat section of the webinar, which I'll be keeping an eye on and answering in real time. So once again, any content-based questions for Steve can go into the Q&A section of the webinar. It's now my great pleasure to introduce the President and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell, to get our program started. Jane? Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Um, it's great to have have your work to pull these uh, webinars together. And this this Lunch Bite series is a particular favorite of ours. We created these when the or very early in the pandemic when people were missing the Capitol in such a ter you know such a way, um, and we're still missing the Capitol. And so what we've done is we have our expert tour guide, uh, Steve Livengood, who has been conducting tours in the Capitol for over 50 years. For 25 years, he's been doing it for the United States Capitol Historical Society. And he knows every inch, every story, every fable of the Capitol. And today he's going to talk in what we call 2.5, because we had a little bit of technical glitch uh, with his internet last time. Uh, so we're gonna pick up on the story that he was telling about the Cox Corridors. Um, and the Cox Corridors are very, very special to the Capitol Historical Society because they were commissioned by the Society as part of our mission to provide uh, resources for the Capitol itself. Um, and they were, the Cox Corridors are in the house wing of the Capitol. And there, there are three themes uh, along the Cox Corridors, uh, Capitol history, the great experiment and westward expansion. Today, Steve is gonna talk to us about the great experiment. And he will invite you periodically to join in questions so please type those into the chat because we'll share them back and forth um, as he moves along and takes you on a virtual tour to the Cox Corridors. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you now to Steve Livengood. Okay, I seem to be unmuted and ready to go. So today we're gonna to continue talking about the Cox Corridors. Um, and uh, uh, here, here is an indication of where they are. Uh, on the right, the Brumidi Corridors have been painted at the time that the wings were uh, built, but uh, the house had not. And so in the early 1950s, uh, or I'm sorry, in the, in the 1960s for the bicentennial of the, of the country. Uh, the US Capitol Historical Society got Alan Cox to paint the corridors on the house side. Uh, this is a drawing of the Capitol and the corridors. The orange ones on the right are the Brumidi corridors and on the left are the Cox corridors. Um, here you can uh, see the, the ones I'm gonna be talking about uh, are down the center on both sides. And uh, on the right is a photograph uh, taken of them. And it shows you the problem, which is the halls are much narrower 
on the House side than they are on the Senate side. And so uh, they couldn't really paint murals on the walls. People wouldn't be able to see them and they'd bump in, into them and so forth. So they painted them on the ceiling. And uh, this is the center corridor uh, taken from each end. The one on the left is taken from the main door uh, of the house wing and looking to the west and the other one is taken from the far end of the that and looking back uh, down the corridors. Uh, here's the comparison of the two hallways and how nice and wide the Bermudi corridors are and narrow the Cox. Um, and you can see the Bermudi corridors are done in the Italian style that uh, Bermudi was familiar with, whereas Cox was trying to make a more accessible um, style uh, that would be more familiar to Americans. So this is what we're going to look at in detail. Here's Alan Cox himself uh, painting uh, on the corridor in a couple of uh, photographs. Now, um, the blue uh, mark is what we're going to talk about today, the Great Experiment Hall. And you can see on the left, this is a, a, um, a photograph of, the, of a guidebook that had the when, back when the public was allowed to walk through on self-guided tours. And so we're gonna talk about the, the one that's marked down the middle there is the Great Experiment Hall. Uh, this is a diagram of what it, is, what it is like and the arrows on the photograph um, match the locations um, that we're gonna be talking about. The, the large uh, figures here, um, are the murals, and we talked about those in the previous session, so I'm going to take up then with the vignettes, which are the ones that are marked in, in blue. Uh, they're much smaller paintings on each side, and they come in pairs in each um, segment of the hallway. Then uh, if we get to it, we'll get to the quotations, which is the orange arrow there. Then there also are the portraits and uh, these are marked in white on this. Uh, they are busts uh, painted in uh, trompe l'oeil, and, um, and we will uh, talk about those as well. So there are 16 of the murals. I'm just gonna flip through them quickly since we talked about them last week, but on either side of, the, of these murals are these vendettes that we're gonna talk about. Uh, so you can see that, that Cox is going through American history kind of in chronological order, but but getting beyond uh, simply uh, events to um, uh, important themes in the construction of American life. So this is the last segment here uh, with Theodore Roosevelt and vigorous government and uh, the women's suffrage parade from 1917. And uh, we asked the question last time, what scenes are left out? And what events should be in the new Cox corridor? We're gonna talk about that some more when we get uh, to the uh, through these other sections. And the, the, uh, the question we want to think about, is the United States still a great experiment? Uh, and uh, this time I'm going to invite you to send later thoughts. There's a, there is my email at the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. And um, uh, if you have thoughts later that you want to add, um, we're going to uh, kind of start a dialogue on that question of, of uh, what should be in uh, an extension of the of the Cox corridors. So back to the back to the drawing here. Uh, we're going to talk about those um, each of these sections and the two vignettes on each side that are in here. Uh, and here's a list of them. We'll be going through them one by one. Uh, there are 32 of them, so it takes me two screens to get them all. Um, the first one. Uh, is a Native American, uh, and this is to indicate, of course, who was uh, in the um, North America when the pilgrims landed. The, the uh, mural on, that they're on either side of is of the Mayflower Compact, um, and they wanted to, to balance this out by gender, and so the, one of the first activities that would have taken place by, uh, specifically by women, uh, who's, who were settling the country at that time was weaving. And so they, uh, this was a very uh, important part of, um, of uh, life in the, in the uh, English colonies. And so uh, 
this is how they symbolize uh, that. Uh, opposite that, the two vignettes are a blacksmith, which was a very early um, activity, and of course a farmer, which is the was one of the primary activities of of the um, original settlers. Then we come to the issue of taxation without representation. You see the, the crest of the king above and the man paying his taxes and obviously not looking terribly happy about it. And then the armed occupation, uh, which was the irritant, particularly in Boston. And uh, uh, so this is the depiction of these issues that began to arise with the country. Um, on the left is the Continental Colors. John Paul Jones raises the American flag. This is the assertion of independence. Uh, but the mixed feeling can be represented by Washington as a British soldier. We know that George Washington actually aspired to be a British soldier and it was when he was badly treated uh, in the, uh, and, uh, uh, and humiliated uh, despite his success as a soldier that, uh, that he saw that there was no possibility uh, and, and that uh, of, of his becoming a British soldier as he wanted to be and uh, therefore uh, recognized that, the, that uh, Americans were not considered equal with the, with the British. Uh, then two of the principles that we revolted to uh, establish were freedom of religion and freedom of the press. Now, on the left is the yeoman farmer at the plow, but the important thing right there in front is that book. Americans were particularly literate and uh, uh, literature and the print printing uh, were very important in American society. And then on the right is the depiction of an unreasonable search or the concern about unreasonable search with a man blocking the door of his home to keep the British soldiers uh, and officials from, from invading his home. The, this was, uh, of course, a major issue with the, um, uh, with the American colonies. Now we get into the part that of our success. Uh, we es quickly established a judicial system that has been quite successful. Uh, and this is uh, characterized by a woman arguing her own case in the court. And on the right, a banking system that we were able to establish very quickly, which, which uh, um, made for stability in our country and made us uh, able to carry on commerce. Free labor. Uh, this is depicting a, a man working on sawing a beam here. And maritime trade. Americans quickly became known for their uh, uh, participation in the in international trade and it became uh, an important part of our society very quickly uh, after, as we established independence. Now we cr we're crossing the great, the um, hall of, of columns that uh, intersects, which means we're halfway through these uh, vignettes. Uh, and uh, on the other side, on the west uh, side of the corridor, uh, we have Simone Bolivar. Uh, there was a clear connection between what had happened in, in the British colonies and the implementation of such, of uh, uh, freedom and, and government by consent of the governed in South America with Simone Bolivar seeing um, the United States as a, as a model. And then the first uh, uh, time we asserted ourselves in international relations was to support the Greek rebels uh, in 1821. So these are two situations where um, our example was followed uh, and we began to have impact back in Europe. Uh, here is on the opposite side is a Union volunteer in our war. He's dressed in blue. That means he's in the Union Army uh, and a freedman voting as one of the results of the Civil War. This is the way we recognize the Civil War in this great experiment. Um, industrialization was one of the next things that happened in our country and this signified by women factory workers, uh, probably in New England where that was most common, uh, but also labor-saving inventions and the cotton gin was probably the most important 
uh, of the uh, of the inventions at that time, and uh, the United States quickly became associated with uh, inventions, and it was recognized uh, all over Europe that that uh, uh, the kind of individual freedom that we had in the United States was releasing a uh, uh, an innovation that had impact uh, all over the world. Then we began to explore ancient civilizations and I've listed the names here. I, uh, I'm not familiar with them myself. John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherwood uh, explored Central America in 1839. That was uh, one of the earliest such uh, expeditions. And then uh, Charles Wilson Peel got the uh, mastodon uh, skeleton um, and uh, established the existence of these um, uh, creatures that didn't didn't exist anymore and made uh, people pay attention to the fact that there had been um, uh, animals that were extinct and so he's shown here and again America was in the lead in this already by that early then we celebrate free public education. You've got the school marm there with two children and uh, land grant colleges and co-educational higher education. Uh, these uh, are in the same section of the hall with the uh, Smithsonian and uh, the Library of Congress. We're celebrating um, uh, education in this country. Uh, steam propulsion, this is a, uh, a steamboat on the Platte River. And, uh, and then construction engineering, this is the Roebling Bridge at uh, Niagara Falls over the Niagara River, which is the first uh, really successful uh, bri bridge like that. And um, uh, Americans were given credit for, for this kind of, of uh, building going on. And of course, then that uh, takes us to the Panama Canal, uh, which had been attempted by other countries, but the United States was the one that came in and did it. Uh, and then the uh, advent of conservation and the Forest Service. Uh, this is Gifford Pinchot, the father of the Forest Service here. Um, and so those are the things that we're recognizing in that hall. And it finally ends with the first woman in Congress, Jeanette Rankin uh, from Montana, and the first African-American in Congress, Joseph Rainey from South Carolina. And these two frame the, the mural of the um, suffrage parade. So now I want to stop for a little bit and, uh, and get uh, your thoughts and let you take some time to put them in the chat or, or write them down and email them to me. Uh, I was thinking what vignette since 1917 could be in a new Cox corridor. And so I just listed a few uh, that might characterize um, American life in the 20th century. Uh, so here's a few suggestions and um, what do you think is missing? And let's take a couple of minutes here. Steve, we're getting um, we're getting some ideas. Um, somebody suggested uh, the Stonewall. Uh, uh, somebody suggested that we focus on do one on computers, technology, the Apollo moon landing, the invention of of the of Microsoft, and World War II. Good ideas. Okay, um, and as I said, feel free to email me more suggestions and we'll compile all of these and maybe have a, a session that includes them. Now we're gonna go back to the diagram again. Uh, and this time we're gonna talk about the uh, relief busts. And uh, these are the, are the white uh, dots across the diagram here. 
and we're just going to talk about uh, some of them. There's two in each bay. Uh, and here's a list of them, but we'll go through them uh, individual. They are in pairs, and there's good reason for the pairs. Uh, William Brewster and uh, Anne Hutchison are depicted in the, in the first pair. Brewster, of course, was the, the leader of the, of the uh, pilgrims. Anne Hutchison is the first woman leader recognized amongst the leaders of Massachusetts. And so we honor the two of them in the first section uh, before the revolution. Then the two great orators of the revolution, Sam Adams and Thomas Paine, uh, get into the second section to characterize the revolution itself. Then uh, George Mason and Roger Sherman, both of these men made contributions to the Constitution. Mason is considered the father of the Bill of Rights. Uh, he wouldn't support the Constitution until there was a, uh, a Bill of Rights in it for individuals, and we owe that to him. Roger Sherman is the author of the Great Compromise, the one that uh, settled the major issue as to whether the houses of Congress were going to represent the, uh, the states, state governments, or the people, and he suggested we do both. So he's credited with that. Then we have Frederick Muhlenberg, the first speaker of the House of Representatives, and John Jay, the first Chief Justice, representing the legislative branch and the um, uh, judicial branch. Then um, we get to the issue of slavery. We have Salmon Chase on the left here, the, uh, one of the great abolitionists, and uh, John C. Calhoun, uh, the leader of the South. This is the clash that was going on at that time uh, leading up to the Civil War. Then we have Noah Webster. This is not Daniel, even though it looks a lot like Daniel. Uh, but Noah Webster, of course, is the father of the dictionary. And so uh, he's rec represented for his intellectual leadership. Uh, he wanted to uh, establish a dictionary of American language as opposed to the British uh, or English language. And so uh, uh, he put us on the map with that publication. John J. Audubon, of course, is the one who, who uh, began to record the nat natural, um, uh, the natural world in the United States and made the wonderful drawings, particularly of birds. Then Eli Whitney, the inventor of the cotton gin and of uh, mass production, uh, his uh, gun factory used um, an assembly line. And, uh, and so he's recognized not only for inventing the cotton gin, but for inventing the, the industrial process. Uh, and one of the most prominent industrialists is Peter Cooper. Uh, he's still represented in New York City by the Cooper Union. And he was the one who felt that the workers ought to be educated. And so he provided education for the workers in his industry and set the example of taking care of the workers. Finally, uh, Clara Barton, uh, the, of course, the founder of the Red Cross and one of the most prominent women in American society, and Gifford Pinchot, the father of the Forest Service, talking about conservation. So those are the, um, those are the people that have been recognized, the 16 through, through the uh, Cox Corridors. And again, let's pause and think for a little bit about who else uh, could be uh, represented in an extended co corridors. These are a few names that came up uh, to me uh, as I was thinking about it. Uh, lots of individuals here. Steve, as we get into this, um, you've got a question. Um, are the historic scenes in the Cox Corridor are murals as opposed to frescoes, which is what's in the Bermuda Corridors. Is that true? Uh, it's true that they're not frescoes, uh, but the, the frescoes are also considered murals. The Cox Corridor paintings are on canvas. The canvas is stuck to the wall, but can be removed. So they, the Cox Corridor is oil on canvas, which is not fresco. The fresco is painted right on the plaster itself. Uh, so they are, they are fundamentally different, yes. 
And can you explain the uh, process that Trump deoiled? Uh, Trump Loy is the is the pro, is a way of depicting three dimensional objects in two dimensions. So here I'll go back to some of the these two. Uh, you can see those look like uh, um, carvings uh, uh, as busts, but they're not. They're a flat painting. And one of the reasons why Alan Cox was chosen as the artist of the Cox corridors is because he was a master of this particular technique. Uh, Constantino Brumidi was the was in many ways the best uh, of that, and certainly the one who who introduced it uh, into the capital. And so they wanted someone. Uh, I should say we wanted we the Capital Historical Society wanted someone who could continue that uh, because that's a major feature. And so the fact that Alan Cox could do that um, was one of the reasons why he was selected as the artist. So uh, it's a way of painting in shadows of using darker paint to make it look like uh, the, uh, the artwork is three-dimensional when it's not. Uh, trompe l'oeil in French means trick the eye. And so it's a, a particular technique that, that uh, uh, was admired so much in Brumidi that they wanted to continue it in the Cox corridors. Does that answer the question? That is perfect. Now let, let's get down to who might get their uh bust in a Trump loy uh, suggestions from our listeners, Martin Luther King, uh, uh, FDR, Dr. Fauci, Billy Graham, Jackie Robinson, uh, Henry Ford, uh, Walt Disney, how about an astronaut, Frank Lloyd Wright, Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, well, Frederick Law Olmsted is already depicted in the Capitol since he did the Capitol grounds. Um, so he's in the Hall of Capitals. Okay. Well, you know, we're just trying to put that. Yep. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. All, you know. all good ideas. Okay. We can go on now to the um, quotations. And, uh, as you can see in the photograph, above every door down that hallway is a quotation. And uh, so I'm just gonna go slowly through them. The, the orange arrows here indicate where the quotations are uh, in the diagram and in the photograph. Uh, it's interesting the quotations are not in chronological order. They tend to deal with the topic of that particular section, uh, even though it's fairly recent. So here are some of the all the people that are quoted in this particular hallway. Um, William Henry Harrison um, and Carl Sandberg are the pair for the first uh, segment. And this is the one that talks about uh, before the revolution, the, the original settlement depicts uh, the, um, the Mayflower and uh, the Albany Congress. So they chose the Quotation from William Henry Harrison, the only legitimate right to government is an express grant of power from the governed. And indeed, government by consent of the governed is the principle, uh, the main principle that we have uh, established with this great experiment. Uh, but Carl Sandburg said, whenever a people or an institution forgets its hard beginnings, it is beginning to decay. And uh, this is, uh, this is telling us why we need to pay attention to our history, uh, that, we, uh, that we cannot forget the hard beginnings that we had uh, as Europeans came to this country. Then talking about the revolution, of course, Patrick Henry, the great uh, orator, I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. So he is uh, in some ways denying history here. He says uh, it's, it is his own personal experience um, and not the experience of a lot of dead people that uh, by which he is going to be guided in his life. And this is the consent of the governed. Uh, so this in some ways balances out the um, previous question about paying attention to history. 
William Jennings Bryan, 1908, our government conceived in freedom and purchased with blood can be preserved only by constant vigilance. Um, this was uh, quoted in the lead up to World War I. Uh, it's what he's talking about. And, um, uh, but it is, it is, this is in the second, second section uh, when we're talking about the revolution. Now, Daniel Webster talking in 1840, when tillage begins, other arts follow. The farmers therefore are the founders of human civilization. And of course, this was the, uh, the pattern of American history uh, in, in the westward expansion. Uh, and, uh, um, but is something that is not nearly as recognized today. Uh, but certainly is a theme of American history. And Benjamin Franklin saying in 1722, without freedom of thought, there can be no such thing as wisdom and no such thing as public liberty without freedom of speech. That, uh, that of course, is what's going on in our competition with China at the moment and what's happening uh, uh, with the suppression of freedom of speech there and other places around the world. This principle we're still uh, experimenting with as, uh, as human society. Then I apologize for the shakiness of this uh, photograph. I need to go back and get another one. Let us build broad and wide these foundations. This is Ignatius Donnelly talking in 1868. Uh, let us build broad and wide these foundations. Let them abut only on the everlasting seas. This is the point at which we're, we have gone from one coast to the other, from sea to shining sea. And uh, Donnelly, a labor leader, is talking about the foundations uh, of, uh, of the society that we're going to be building in this great land that we have uh, acquired. And then Louis Brandeis, talking 1925, the greatest dangers to liberty lurk in insidious encroachment by men of zeal, well-meaning, but without understanding. Of course, Louis Brandeis was a famous uh, Supreme Court justice and often talked about civil liberties. And uh, here he is talking about the dangers to liberty uh, by men of zeal, well-meaning, but without understanding. And we continue with that issue in this country as well. In the fifth section, which would be the one across the hall that talks about uh, the um, liberty, the uh, freedom in, in uh, South America and Greece and, and the Civil War here. Franklin Roosevelt says, we must remember that any oppression, any injustice, any hatred is a wedge designed to attack our civilization. And of course, this is um, right at the beginning of World War II. And William Allen White, speaking at the same time, uh, William Allen White had been a, uh, um, an isolationist and a, and a, a progressive that had uh, begun to support World War II. And wherever a free man is in chains, we are threatened also. Whoever is fighting for liberty is defending America. This is as we moved into world leadership and the world looked to the United States to, to preserve the principles of this great experiment. In the next section, we go back to uh, Samuel Adams, 1776, freedom of thought and the right of private judgment in matters of conscience direct their course to this happy country. And Samuel Adams is saying this already in 1776, um, even before uh, the, or around the time of the, of the declaration of our independence. Uh, matters of conscience direct their course to this happy country that um, he's suggesting that Americans are happy happier in this great experiment. And then Franklin Delano Roosevelt again in 1940, we defend and we build a way of life, not for America alone, but for all mankind. 
And this again is the assertion of American leadership that our, our great experiment is so successful that, the, that we uh, carry it on on behalf of all of human uh, civilization. And of course that is uh, at issue again today. William Ellery Channing, the, the uh, great uh, um, Unitarian minister, labor is discovered to be the grand conqueror enriching and building up nations more surely than the proudest battles. And it occurred to me, I hadn't thought about the fact that in this period that he's speaking is the point at which we went from recognizing uh, nations for the success of their armies and the, and the success of their of their um, monarchs to recognizing that, it, that nations are built up not on armies, but on labor and ordinary people. And so that's what we're celebrating here with Ch the Channing quote from 1838. Henry Ward Beecher, a uh, great liberal minister had campaigned against slavery. Uh, he, his biography is called the most famous man in America. Beecher says, he that inventions, invents a machine augments the power of a man and the well-being of mankind. Uh, we tend not to think of machines that way nowadays, but in fact, at that time when machines were showing their ability to, to enhance the power of human beings and to create this um, uh, juggernaut of a society uh, was being celebrated by people like Beecher. Uh, in its contribution to the well-being of mankind. Then we have Theodore Roosevelt talking about uh, conservation. The nation behaves well if it treats the natural resources as assets, which it must turn over to the next generation increased and not impaired in value. This is the point at which we're switching from uh, bragging about the, the, the um, our ability to exploit our continent to beginning to recognize that our continent has that has limitations and we need to be careful about the use of our natural resources. Um, Thomas Jefferson back in 1816 said, enlighten the people generally and tyranny and oppression of body and mind will vanish like evil spirits at the dawn of day. So he is uh, advocating education here uh, of the voters. So now let's stop again and think about um, uh, the quotations and what things have been said. I just pulled up three of them that I thought of happens. Uh, the first being Franklin Roosevelt, of course, and the, the next two, John Kennedy. Um, what other uh, uh, quotations should be added since 1917? And are any of them that we have reviewed things that should be replaced. Uh, some of them seem a little superannuated. And, um, and so let's stop and think about that for a few minutes. And then we'll uh, just open it up to general questions. And Steve, as people are thinking about it, um, what was the process that the Historical Society went through in selecting the quest quotations? Um, I have not found any documentation of the process itself. Uh, I know that, that uh, uh, they were greatly screened and, and that there was much discussion about them. Uh, and certainly it would have been, it was not the Historical Society's choice alone. Uh, we probably uh, proposed some, but uh, uh, would have brought in the resources of the Congress and, and uh, gotten approval from uh, the Congress itself and the, and the leadership as to what quotations uh, would be included here. So we've got, we've got some proposals here. Um, and question is, oh, before we get into the proposals, do you have any insight into uh, uh, Cox's font and style collect, you know, why did he choose that particular style to put the quotations in, do you know? Uh, well, I, uh, my guess would be that they look historic uh, and the, the um, certainly the 
the capitalization of the nouns and so forth would date to uh, the 18th century. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it was certainly to make them look historic, but, but be quickly readable. We wouldn't want a, a lot of, of fancy writing like the Declaration of Independence is where you, you can't read it uh, quickly or easily. So those were the two values that, that immediately occur to me. I don't know if uh, somebody else has some thoughts like that, put it in the chat and let's talk about it. So here's, here's, here's a suggestion for you. One small step for man, a giant step for mankind. Absolutely. Uh, you must do things you think you cannot do. Eleanor Roosevelt. Ah, uh -huh. Yeah, in fact, uh, not many women quoted uh, in all those quotations. There are some in other in other hallways, but uh, uh, but not women. Not many women quoted here. I hadn't hadn't even picked that up. All right, now, friends, we have not enough women. We need a quote from women. Let's. Yes. So let's have some suggestions about that. But instead we have a, a Steve Jobs, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Creativity is just connecting things. I'd have to look up, but there was a great one from Gloria Steinem that said, if you got run over and they pulled your checkbook, they would know what you care about. Mm. Abigail Adams, don't forget the ladies. Failure is impossible. Susan B. Anthony, Black Lives Matter. Certainly some quotations from Martin Luther King's uh, speech at the Lincoln Memorial and the March on Washington ought to be included. I have, I have a, dream. a dream that little black children and little white children will walk hand in hand. Uh, I've been to the mountaintop. I've looked over. I may not get there with you, my friends. Well, as you think of it, Send send them in. Uh, we're happy to take it take it and take it under advisement. So we have one one final one from his mother. Don't you love it? Uh, with or her mother, uh, which says, "My mother told me to be a lady, and for her that meant to be your own person and to be independent." Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Huh. So carry on, Steve, go to the next adventure. Okay, um, I'm gonna go back and, um, uh, and show my, uh, my email address. And um, um, there we go. And uh, that's all I have prepared for today. Uh, so uh, if people have comments um, or questions, I can answer them here. Got a couple more, uh, more contributions to the uh, quote thing uh, okay. idea. Maya Angela, people will forget a lot of things, but they will never forget how you treat them. Uh, and like from, Shirley, from Shirley Chisholm, tremendous amounts of talent are being lost to our society just because that talent wears a skirt. Mm -hmm. The other Maya Angelou one um, is very similar to the one that's proposed, which is that something to the effect of people will not necessarily remember what you said to them, but they will remember how you made them feel. 
Mm -hmm. Well, this is a this is a great uh, great adventure. Lots of things to think about. Um, let's let's turn to upcoming events um, because one of the things we knew we knew this one would be a little shorter because this was sort of the makeup when we had a little bit of technical problems. You know, you love technology, but then not necessarily. Um, as we look ahead, our final uh, our final webinar in the More Perfect Union series. Um, this is the series that we have been doing since October, uh, looking at the continuing struggle to meet our goal of being a more perfect union, which means an inclusive union with uh, equal justice for all and full participation, um, will involve uh, a speech, a uh, talk about immigration in the 20th and 21st centuries by Professor Carrie Rosenbaum, who is an immigration attorney. Um, and she will give us a great thought. She, she received her um, law degree from the University of California at Davis and is currently focused on immigrant integration, um, the constitutionality of immigration laws, the repercussion of the war on drugs for immigration and immigrant law. And Lexis Nexus publishes her work and recognizes her as an expert commentator. So do join us next Thursday for that conversation about immigration. We have a special uh, lunch bite on the 1st of June, um, which is a book talk. Uh, Dr. James Banner has written a book called The Ever-Changing Past. And his theory is that all history is revisionist history because any examination of the past will always be done in the context of the interpretations that make a difference in terms of our own experience now. So he will go through the arc of time uh, all the way through the Civil War and beyond. So join us for Dr. Banner's uh, presentation. We look forward to that. Um, and then on the 15th, we return to uh, Lunch Bites Part 3, uh, Look, the Cox Corridor Part 3. Uh, Steve has done a great deal of research um, and photography about the Cox Corridors. And so there will be ultimately uh, four parts of the Cox Corridors. So part three will be on June 15th. We hope you'll join us for these events as we move into the warmer months. Um, we are hopeful, hopeful, hopeful that you might be interested in a walking tour of the grounds of the Capitol. It's a little challenging because the fence is still up around the inner perimeter, uh, but we are able to offer walking tours that you can't see it as well as you could without the fence, but we can still tell the story of the Capitol. So if you have anyone who's interested in that, please do let us know. Um, as always, we invite you to support the United States Capitol Historical Society by your contributions, by sharing information about our work with your friends and neighbors, by purchasing our merchandise like our mugs. Um, our merchandise department is working on some special uh, patriotic socks for the 4th of July. So stay tuned. Uh, we're gonna take all of the uh, suggestions that you have and compile them uh, as we're looking forward. Thank you very much. We appreciate your support and thank you, Steve, for your commentary and your information as you share it with us. We're grateful to have such an incredible group of supporters. Thank you, goodbye.